sometimes it looks daunting, but it's something that you can do by yourself. So um, right. for those people who like, are worrying that they may need a lawyer, you may not need one. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And today we have a very special guest. We have Monique here with us. And we will be sharing with you guys how to come to Canada as a permanent resident from outside of Canada. So welcome, Monique. Thank um, you. Thank you for before having we me. get started, let them know when you came to Canada, basically, and how you came to Canada. Of course, you guys might figure by now, she came to Canada as a landed immigrant. We can move from there. I came to Canada first in 2019 um, when I was landed. I did the professional route. So I did the federal express entry, which is for the skilled workers. And it was from outside of the country. So I've been here full time since 2020. And um, yeah, <laughs> it was a long process, but it wasn't, it wasn't tedious or it wasn't hard to understand. I know sometimes it looks daunting, but it's something that you can do by yourself. So um, right. for those people who like are worrying that they may need a lawyer, you may not need one. Yeah, it's almost a straightforward process and you are basically paying them for you to do the work because you'll have to gather everything nonetheless. And we'll share in this video what you need to gather. But the essence of it is you are basically putting your personal information there. And the only time you probably need a lawyer is probably if you have a special case because some people have special cases. And if you have a special case, you know, like probably you have an adopted child or something, then that's, you know, that's where we kind of want professional advice. And it doesn't have to be a full on lawyer to do your full process because we have consultants that can provide you with the information. Let's talk first of all, Monique, about starting the process. Like how did you start? And then we can basically give a general idea to people about how to start. Like, where, where did you start from? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. The first thing is that you need a post-secondary qualification. That's it. Uh, either in one of the skilled areas or a degree, for example. Yeah. Um, what I did was, the first thing I did was I checked to see if I had enough score to qualify. Yeah. And um, there are tools online for that, um, three tools actually. Yeah, I'll, put, um, I'll put a link below so you can calculate your CRS score to have an idea if you are qualified. The very, very first thing I did when I realized that I may have enough points for this was get my degree verified. And from outside of the country, the only agency at the time that did it was west.ca. And I think, um, Sanjay, you have spoken about them before in the past. Yes. And they ask for your degree, a copy of your degree. They also ask for your transcript. And they ask that it is sent directly from the institution to them. They don't want you to be a part of the handling. I'm not sure if there's any changes made since COVID. When you're choosing which one of the assessment that they should do on your degree, you have to ensure that you select the correct one. There's yeah. one for schools. There's one for the permanent resident immigration purposes. There's a third one for those persons who have like um, uh, those degrees that also have those. Uh, Licensing uh, bodies. Right. Yes. So there's, yes. there's also that. So you have to ensure that if you're doing it for immigration purposes, mm -hmm. you select for immigration. Second thing I did was sign up for the English test. And the reason why I'm starting it this way is because of the length of time, the wait period sometimes for the English test. I believe the degree um, verification takes about 12 weeks. It takes a, a good time. And the wait period sometimes for the English test, which is the ALS test, sometimes it's up to six months. Yeah. I signed up January 20. Um, 2018 and I didn't do my test until um, June so if this is the route that you want to take the first the very very first things you need to do is one start the process to get your degree verified and two to sign up to do that English um, test now yeah. there are things um, 
But then I guess if it, it depends on the country that you're in, because if the country that right. you're in, they don't have a lot of people doing the test, then I think it would be safe if you want, or if you're gonna wait a little while before you do your application, then because the test is valid for two years. So you right. want to make sure that everything else is ready to submit your application before, let's say you're, you can book a test today and do it tomorrow, but you are not planning to do your application within a year, then you want to basically schedule a timeline for yourself on when you're going to submit the application so that it's being done in the right time and you don't have to pay to redo the test. For right. the English test as well, you have to ensure that if you're doing it for immigration purposes, you select that one. Do not select the one for school. So you have to select general versus um, the one for school. So that was the first thing. And as Sanjay did say, the process might be different from country to country. But for um, Jamaica, for example, where there's always a con continuous flow of persons that are doing this process, there may be a very wait, long wait period. Yeah. Um, so that was the first two things I did. Also, after that, after the six months would have passed, I did the English test. I had already gotten back the paper to say that um, my degree is equivalent to a four-year degree in Canada. My master's degree is equivalent to a two-year. After you've gotten your um, English test results and they recommend that you have, I think, a seven point. So it's a point system for the English test. So they want your score to be between seven and nine. Nine being the highest. Yeah. So um, benchmark, I believe, is seven. Um, mm -hmm. And that is for the IELTS. Um, That's right. But if you you are, some, for some reason, you're in Canada as a visitor and you want to do your application, you can also do the CELPIP. The CELPIP is the Canadian English test that you can also do. You don't have to do the IELTS. The difference between the CELPIP and the IELTS is that the CELPIP is strictly online. The range is a little bit wider. It's up to 12. Um, mm -hmm. And you want to score 10 or 9 and above. So that, that's the difference there. Right. right. So yeah. you have to um, pay attention to that. I will also want to segue to say this. Not because English is your first language. Do not take this test lightly, okay? Listen, people, we are from Jamaica and our first language is English. And, you know, to be honest, like when I thought about this, I was like, listen, I'm going to score the highest. Let me just put in that I get 12 out of 12 on this thing because uh, I, we do English from we know ourselves. Right. Um, Right. Yes, I did pretty well. I I do good. But a lot of persons from Jamaica, from the Caribbean, English speaking, it's not the same. Like I wouldn't say it's testing your English, to be honest. That's for another video. But anyways, yes. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And the thing is, it's not that it's a hard test. It's a very long test. I think that is the issue. It's yeah. very long. It yeah. takes the entire day. So um, please do not underestimate this test. After I got the passing grades and I also got the, um, my assessment, I then started the profile on um, Canada.ca. Yeah, and to start the profile, you create what we call a GC key and that yes. way you can monitor your own application. So that's why we say you don't really need a lawyer for all of this because Everything yeah. is pretty much straightforward. You're answering your own questions and you're uploading all of these documents that we mentioned before yeah. onto the GC key. So just go on cic.gc.ca, you type in GC key and you create an account. That's where you start. And then they'll ask you to complete a questionnaire. And the questionnaire mm -hmm. is basically, you need to be honest answering all the questions because they will then ask you to provide documentation as proof for everything exactly. that you mentioned that you have. Exactly. Um, so as Sanjay said, you have to be very honest. They ask you your marital status, family. Family for this process is not just siblings. It's either your spouses or your children. Mm -hmm. um, but this process, there's another part of the process that they'll ask about siblings and they'll ask about your parents. Yeah. But for this part, they only want to know about common law um, mm -hmm. or married uh, partner and children or adopted children. Yeah. Um, 
after you give them all that information, then from the information that you have, they'll say, okay, you can now move on. Now moving on, this is where you now upload all the things that you need for an invitation to apply. Um, This is the very first step. So I'm I'm just going to go through the list of the things that they they ask for. Mm -hmm. So they'll ask for um, stuff like your birth certificate. This is where you upload your assessment. They'll ask for the the passport, all the pages that were stamped. They want to know um, their travel pattern for the last five years. So it's either the past 10 years or since your 18th birthday when it comes on to like work experience. Yes. Yeah. So if you have not been working 10 years, that's fine. But yeah. whatever job that you've had since age 18 up until whatever age you are when you're doing this application, they need a signed copy from your employer. Also, for the, for the any point in, your, in time that you have not worked, make sure to make note of that to say, I was not working. I was not even self-employed. I was just not working. You're right. Not working. Yeah. Right. Now, after you've uploaded all of that, they'll also need like, you know, passport size photo um, and all, all of that. Then you send all of that in and you submit. Yeah. On the portal, you, you'll get a letter to say that, you know, we have um, received your application and they give, they give you the range of time that you have to wait. They, they do the draw. Um, they don't tell you, but pattern wise, it's every every two weeks. Um and so for me, I was in the next draw. So after I submitted, there was a week gap. Yeah. I submitted the week of that draw. And then the other week, I was sent that inv- invitation to apply. Now, this is where the real work starts. Mm-hmm. And before, when I was doing it, it was you had 90 days. First, it was 60. Then they First, extended yes. it to 90 days. First, it was 60. Then 90. Yes. And then they brought it COVID. Do, then they brought it back, but then during COVID, they extended it. So mm-hmm. if you're 90 days past during COVID, you don't, you didn't have to worry. Um, they just gave you that time because you might can't go to the medical office, different things like that you mm-hmm. can't get to do. So for this process, there's a list of things that you'll need here. So you'll need your police record, medical record, proof of funding, which I'll get back to, um, your birth certificate, um, marriage certificate if you have. This is where you also do stuff like your children. If um, if you are doing it for your family, you do your spouse, your children. If you have a name change, you need a sign mm-hmm. affidavit. Yeah. Every every that's where everything comes. Mm-hmm. In in my experience, the the first things you go after, like right out of the gate, and I'll I'll say this: anything that you need to do in whatever country. On the website, they will always tell you those approved groups or approved entities that they work with. So if it's for the medical, they'll they'll have a list of the approved doctors that they will accept your medical from. You have to make sure you use them. Do not just go to your regular family doctor. They will not accept that. You have to go to these approved medical doctors. For your proof of funding, (laughs) if you are single, and you do not have a job offer. They recommend yeah. that you have about 13000 Canadian dollars as proof yeah. of funding. And I think it went up. So just make sure that you are checking every time to see. Because exactly. um, the application fees change. The amount of money that you need change. So, yeah. The reason why they ask for this $13,000 is that they want to save. You're here. And you don't have a job, you're able to sustain yourself. Yeah, you're not depending on the, the system. So they are you're worried not... that people are stressing the system, right? Because right. that's why they have so much requirements, because they need you to be a good candidate, essentially. No, if you have if you have a spouse and children, that goes up by the amount of persons that mm-hmm. is in your household. Be very, very cognizant of that. Yeah. So um, if if it's 13,000 and this is when I was in, so as Sanjay said, it would be more, 13000 for one person. With COVID, things, things are changing, like, very rapidly, so we can't give you any constant figures because it's not really constant, but we'll tell you, you know, what and what you need. You can get uh, just a letter from the bank to say okay, you bank. have this amount of money in your bank account. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have a credit card, this is what I did, and it's because the bank was just taking forever. The bank needed me to write a physical letter, which I did, 
take the physical letter to them physically, which I did. And then I, it was just radio silence. If you have a credit card, just take your statements up to the six months. Mm -hmm. So this, your, your last six month statements, just use that. Yeah. Put them together and, and you can upload it like that. Like if, if your bank won't give you the statement, just use your credit card. Another statement. thing that you can do is if you have online banking, you can print the summary of your account from your online banking and then you can get it stamped by in jamaica we call them justice of the peace here in canada we call them notary republic so do do not wait on the, as i said it, it was 60 days um now that they're shifting things around again um just a couple of days ago i realized they're doing some more shifting around just keep in mind that you have a very short even if you do have a long space of time try to do it as in as quick as time as possible and i'll just reiterate from where we start one eight so basically you need all your transcript for your your degree your post-secondary degrees that you have if it's a master's um a, just a bachelor's degree a doctorate and then we talked about the english test that you need and then we talk about the proof of funds so we add in stuff to it as we go on they need a police record as well. The next thing is for the digital picture, they have their own specification. Please yeah. follow it. They have a thing here. Um, they send it to you and they show you like how much centimeters yeah. Yeah. your head needs to be away from the edges and you have to follow it. So this is the reason why I tell you, you may not need a lawyer. Whenever you're doing your uploads, they have little buttons on each line item that you need. So it's a question mark and you click it and it tells exactly. you exactly what document they're asking you for. Exactly. The, the also, it shows you when you've uploaded the document. So if you're missing a document, it will let you know that we it, don't have this document. Yes. And then once you have all of that, then you submit, you pay a right to permanent residency. Yes, fee, so you pay two fees. And, There's two fees that you pay, but one of the fees you don't have to pay when you are submitting the application. But before they give you the permanent residency, you will have to pay that fee. So just pay the fee right off the bat. You don't, <laughs> so you don't even want, everything. if you want to come, don't bother worry about the fee and, you know, why am I to pay this? What's it called? Like literally, I didn't even bother to say what is this called or anything. I was just like, okay, there's two fees and they give you the total at the end. You can choose to pay it full, pay it in full. Exactly. And if you send your receipt, you keep your receipt. If you don't have a lawyer or a consultant, my suggestion is because your paperwork will speak for you, right? You can mm -hmm. write what they call a LOE, a letter of explanation. So if you think something kind of look strange with your documents, you just or it, it don't it don't even have to look strange, but you need to provide clarity. For example, your job letter didn't spell your name right, or something wasn't as accurate as you think it should be. You can write like a LOE and explain it. And they do make provision for those other documents, as they would call it. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Then so after that. The next thing now is the waiting game. The next thing that they'll reach out to you for is a biometrics, which is where they take, scan your eyes and your yeah. fingerprint. And I think the biometrics at one point in time was for persons that have never applied for a Canadian visa or did anything with Canada. Right. If you, you like have a Canadian visa before or something, you have 10 years on the biometric. But now I think everybody is required to do a biometric unless they change it. But mm -hmm. I know that once upon a time, and I don't know if they're changing it back because of COVID, because I never had to do any biometrics. It, it just updated to say I basically had time because from when I had the visa, when I did all of the biometrics, it's still good to go. So now in this present time, you might not have to do a biometric if you have a visa. For persons that have never visited Canada, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing for you guys. But just know that if you have, you can basically forget about that step and it kind of push your application a little bit more. And they do, they do say that they're like, they, they have that section on the on the profile where mm -hmm. even before you've get you've gotten to this point, they would have made a notation of your biometric number. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. for me, I've never had a Canadian visa before. So I had to do that biometric. Mm -hmm. And you just they send a, a 
paper, you take it in, okay, you get the biometric done, and you go about your business, and then you wait again. Yeah. And then you will get an email, as you normally would, to say you need to check your profile. And this is where they ask you to send in your passport now. Oh, okay. You, you mean at the end now. So now you get approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get a tracking number. It's usually in, in Jamaica, it's through DHL. So, you know, it's always trackable. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes two to three weeks. They send it back. On the time, whenever they choose. Right. Of course, COVID sends everything out of work. Mm -hmm. You may wait two months. It's fine. Do not panic. <laughs> yeah. Then <laughs> you would get papers, your paperwork. All the paperwork now for you to get landing, they'll give you a deadline. So enter Canada. Canada. Um, the deadline is usually about six months after the date of the, the PR. So you've got that uh, notification. Then no. So the next thing now is for you to start pack up your life to move to Canada. On the day of travel, and of course, we won't have to tell you about pre-COVID, <laughs> um, all the COVID steps that you have to take. Let's just assume you did all you need to do. When yeah. you get to the, the airport, you need to tell them that you are a new PR coming in for you to, and you need to get landed. Yeah. Once you tell them, they'll take you to a, a different section of the airport for you to get landed. You can't just walk out the airport. Please don't. Support. Please don't. As a matter of fact, if you feel like you're being left alone, say something. Find somebody and say, hey, I need to get landed. Where do I go? Just mm -hmm. make sure you get landed. You're given a paper and they ask you to visit Service Canada. Yes. And there is actually a Service Canada in the airport just beside that officer that you go to, that you look over and you're like, okay, I can get my sin right there. It kind of takes away some of the pressure of having to run around to get your sin up on your first day, especially during COVID and you don't know when things close. It's online. It's taking a little bit longer and you really need your sin. So if you can come in a decent time, you can even check on their website to see what time the Service Canada in the airport is open. So I think we have covered everything that you would need and we have covered start to end. Um, so money shared her experience with you guys and i hope that was useful you get to see somebody that did it and the process is not very tedious like we said thank you money for joining on this wonderful episode everyone thank you for tuning into the video as usual really really appreciate it and remember to like share comment and subscribe to the channel